this is the the very first part of the book. And uh, actually a little tiny bit of it in the in your notes. Um, I remember watching my father's pale, naked form disappear up into the crackling flame that had suddenly destroyed the nursery on the third floor of our house in Berkeley. I remember hearing his frantic cries of the baby, the baby, growing fainter and fainter while my mother and I stood as still as statues in the garden outside. It was a clear, cold California night, cold moon. The hills looked black above our house. The trees seemed even blacker. Acrid smoke billowed towards us, mingling with the pungent scent of the eucalyptus groves rustling nearby. Presently, the smoke covered the moon. Mama and I waited for what seemed like hours, gripping each other's hands, until, just as the wailing fire engine arrived in the steep drive below, my father emerged panting from the house. His entire body was covered with soot. He couldn't stop hopping up and down because the soles of his bare feet were badly burned. But he was smiling a goofy, triumphant smile because my brother, my three-and-a-half-week-old brother, Mark Decombe Jr., was safe and miraculously sleeping in the crook of his arm. Still standing next to me, Mama made little mewing sounds in her throat, and then she tore off her blue satin robe and ran to my father and tried to wrap it around him. And I ran after her, and for one brief second, we huddled close together, a family unit, one of the few times I ever remember us being literally close. Mama kept dropping the robe because Daddy was jumping up and down with pain, and, and, he, and so she kept trying to cover his nakedness, and he wouldn't let her. I'm okay, I'm okay, Quixie, he murmured, using the nickname he often used for her. Her real name was Anna Gertrude. I'm okay! His eyes glittered at a soot black, blackened grin, but they were staring not at her, but in the distance. His expression seemed haunted, almost crazy, as if he witnessed a holocaust and survived it. Indeed, he would later tell us that the experience of running across the glowing cobbles of the nursery floor of the baby's bassinet and feeling the fire racing after him was like running away from death. He didn't even seem to notice that our garden was filling with neighbors from adjoining houses in the hills. Firemen appeared dragging rubber hoses to the ivy beds so that they could shoot geysers of water directly into the windows of the blazing nursery. It was a wonder that there was so much movement in the night, so much purpose. Flames streaked through the dark, cool air, sparks fell and melted away on the ivy beds. My cheeks felt burning hot. An ambulance survived. White coated medics bearing a stretcher pushed through the crowd. One of them tried to put my brother out of my father's arms, but he refused to give him up. I'll take part to the hospital. Thank you very much. And with that, he literally danced across the grass. He was in such agony. And Mama ran after him, holding up the blue rope like a shield. The fire roared orange in front of me, jiggling powerful beat. I stood transfixed by the blaze, trembling with excitement. After a moment, someone knelt at my feet and a kindly face pressed close to mine. It was our nurse, Nell Brown, who had, had incredibly plump, freckled arms and a warm stomach I loved to trouble on. She hugged me so close I could taste her tears. Don't you ever forget this night, little doll. Your papa is an awful brave man. Okay, so that's the beginning of this book, which, um, which took me 40 years to write. I will not tell you the story of how I wrote this book. Uh, I, um, I was an actress, as I told you, and, um, and my father also committed suicide, okay? So this was 40 years ago, and I was in the show on Broadway, and um, I, uh, I started thinking that I wanted to write. And I began writing this story, but as a novel. And I called it Anything Your Little Heart Desires. And I wrote a part, like half of it, when I was backstage in my dressing room in Mary Mary. I really did. But because the, the circumstances of my family were so powerfully emotional and tormented and tragic, uh, it did take me 40 years to write it, because I didn't know how to write it. See, I was, I was like we were starting out. I was beginning to realize that I wanted to be a writer, but I didn't know how to write this book. I did remember, you know, this kind of, of incident vividly. I could never forget this. It was like one of the most powerful sort of memories, and also it was kind of became a legend in our house that my father had saved my brother's life, and he also saved it again when my, my brother almost drowned. Things like that I always remembered. But I didn't know how to tell the whole story of my father, who was this fascinating character, very political, 
lawyer for the Hollywood Tender and the Blacklist, he worked with Robert Kennedy. Many, many, he did many wonderful things in his life, political activist. Uh, I wanted to tell that story too. But I technically, I didn't have the craft, so I had to wait until I had become both an editor and then later a journalist. This is a period of over 20, 25 years before I actually started the book itself. But I still had these notes that I had taken um, in my dressing room. Copious notes, thank God. And I also, by the way, I kept a journal. I've always kept a journal, which I urge you to do. Uh, kept a journal since I was 17 years old. And the journal, I think, is, gets better as time goes on. And in the beginning, I was just writing crazy little notes. But bit by bit, I began writing incidents that, that affected me. And I wanted to remember people of sketches and portraits and stuff. But back to this book again, it became not only uh, a memoir, but a biography in that it's historical. Because my father actually was part of history in a small way because he was involved with the Hollywood Tan and with Robert Kennedy. So that I had to research, uh, which is usually you don't research in a memoir. So this is kind of a hybrid form. It's like both, uh, both memoir and biography. Because I did I interviewed people who had known him, who remembered him, people who had worked with him. Uh, and by the same token, I also drew from my mother's journals. My mother was a, a writer. She had written one book. She started out as a columnist at, uh, on this called Bulletin in San Francisco. She's a crime reporter, actually. And, uh, and uh, so she, she also had a lot of notes that I ultimately used in this. I mean, it's filled with with detail, thank God, because of all of the, the stuff that both my mother saved, their newspaper stuff, interviews, it's a combination of everything. So anyway, that's sort of that um, process. I write all the time. I write constantly. If I don't have a pad with me, like today, I forgot to bring my pad, and I'm going to you know, scroll on a piece of paper about what happened here. Um, I'm obsessively wanting to write. And as I get older, I want to write even more. Um, I, one of the things I live by is um, the more memories you have, the more you have lived, which is, you know, part and parcel of the memoir. You are uh, taking your memories, you're, you're exploring them, you're, you're re recreating them, and uh, there's nothing more exciting. And it is sort of energizing when you, when you look back in your life uh, and you realize what you've done. And I think you really can know that better uh, when you write. I mean, you really don't know what you think until you put it on paper. You really don't, I don't think. Um, I know I've been asked to talk a little bit about how I became a writer, how I moved from being an actress to, to a writer. It's sort of a crazy story. I was in, you know, I was on Broadway and acted in television stuff for about 10 years, but I always wanted to write. And when I left Mary Mary, and uh, just sort of recovered a little bit from this tragedy in my family. I, I got a crazy job. I could not get a regular job right away because, I, well, I hadn't had any experience writing. I'd written two pieces that were published in New York Magazine about actors, uh, friends of mine. And uh, as a result, I got a job at a place called Magazine Management, which is no longer in existence, but it was a schlock house. Schlockhouse meaning it published movie magazines, sex action stories, true confessions, <laughs> and I worked in the movie magazine department. It was this crazy place filled with writers, aspiring writers, writers who were also professional, had worked. And the most well known writer there, the best writer there, but he hadn't really done much, was a man named Mario Puzo. And he had been there for nine years. He had to be there because he was so broke, he was a gambler. And he had, to keep, uh, he had to keep writing, ground out stories like almost every week. And Mario was, would always talk to us about a book that he wanted to write called The Gun Club. And people were, you know, didn't think he was ever going to finish it because he took so long. And in fact, I'll never forget, one writer said to him, I don't like that title. <laughs> Seriously, Mario was probably the best writer there, and also, he was a writer that I learned from. I showed him my first work, and he told me what was wrong with it. He believed <coughs> implicitly in telling a great story, and you know, that's hard to do. Uh, 
but he knew how to do it, technically and emotionally in every other way. The thing that really upset him was that he was never considered a great writer. He wanted to be known as a great writer. Instead, he was probably one of the most successful writers of all time, and certainly the movie, The Godfather, the movies, became legendary. But uh, I will never forget being able to sit with him and work with him. Uh, we had marvelous talks together, and I was not the only one, by the way. It was like a, a father figure around the office. Um, but when we all went to the opening of The Godfather, I've never forgotten this, he, uh, he was surrounded by everybody, Al Pacino, Mar Marlon Brando, all of them were there. And we, as a group, from magazine management, <laughs> nobody knew who we were. And one of the guards, you know, bodyguards, were there, said, who are you? And so I said, I'm from magazine management. And Mario jumped up, he hugged me, hugged everybody else. And then he turned to the group, he said, I never would have written The Godfather, never would have been a movie if I hadn't been a magazine management. <laughs> so, anyway, that's how I began my career as a writer in the Schlockhaus. But I learned how to edit magazines, I learned how to put them together. And then finally, I went on to a more conventional magazine, Woman's Day. Uh, and I was also writing freelance for the New York Times. I was always writing a lot, as I told you. writing. Mostly about the arts, about actors and movies and theater, except I knew. But that's also something, if you have a, sort of an area of expertise, it helps. Um, I don't know how much time do you have left? Uh, 20 minutes? Oh, okay. Uh, well, do you want me to talk more about my other career things? Well, I mean, I, let's see, what, did I, what else did I do? Uh, I, uh, I always have had work, worked on magazines. I went from Women's Day to Harper's Bazaar, um, had a brief stint in fashion, which I was not successful at, because as you can see, I'm not that chic looking. But I, I was managing at Harper's Bazaar for a couple of years, and a senior editor of McCall. I sort of ran the gamut of the women's magazines. In those days, I mean, they're not, they're not as, I don't think they're really as important as they were in my day, in the 70s and 80s, you know. Uh, but it was a great training ground for me. And he said, that's the other thing I could tell you, is the more writing you do, the better you'll be. Uh, if you can get assignments now, I guess you could get them on blogs. You could always write them on blogs, which is so important. I write them on blogs now, uh, which I, I did in the beginning. But, um, I went from writing and editing for about 10 years to starting to write biographies. And I wrote my first biography, uh, which was about Montgomery Cliff, the actor. Again, I was very lucky because my father, who was a lawyer, he had been Montgomery Cliff's lawyer. So I had an in, and I was able to talk to his family, and as a result of the fact that my father had been his lawyer, it was very, I was very lucky. And the same is true with, I've had this sort of paradoxical good fortune of almost everybody I've ever written about, I've known, either I've known them pretty well or just known them. Um, Brando I met once, because I'm a member of the Actors Studio, I wrote about him. And that was a, a, an unbelievable experience, because I met him with Marilyn Monroe, and uh, I, I say I met him. I was supposed to give him tickets to a benefit, benefit of the studio. And uh, I was standing outside the door and was told to give Brando his tickets, but I was so nervous at seeing him. And so stunned because he was so gorgeous and she was so beautiful. I didn't give them the tickets. <laughs> Until somebody said, Patty, you don't need to give Brando and Monroe tickets. Let them in the door. <laughs> so as I opened the door, Brando put his hand on my shoulder. And I literally almost made it. <laughs> it was the most thrilling thing. <laughs> These are very silly experiences, but yes, by the way, these are all part of the memoir, you know what I mean? I mean this is, these are my memories, uh, or they're some of my memories. Um, but after I wrote these, these biographies, I guess there were three of them, I wrote one about Ian Harvest, the photographer, Brando, and, uh, and um, Cliff, then that's when I did this book. But it was, it took me ten years to actually write it. Uh, I couldn't do it fast. I just had to do it slow. And there was so much that I wanted to be able to put in it. And I wanted to tell these dual stories, not only of my father, his career, his politics, 
but the personal story of our family and how his choices, his political stands, influenced and affected my brother and my, my mother and myself. So uh, it was a huge undertaking, and it's the book I'm proudest of. I, I think it's my best book. It's, uh, it's a, a, a labor of love in a way. Because that's the other thing you don't, you know, you really, no matter how much money you get, if you work for a book for 10, 10 years, you, you have to also have a job at the same time. Um, but, but that didn't matter. But as I said, this is my, my favorite book. But uh, the last book I've written, um, which again took me a long time, was this biography of Jane Fonda. And Jane and I had known each other when we were kids at the actor studio. And so again, I had an in, I was lucky, I knew her, so I could uh, could reach her and talk to her. And I thought I would just read you just a tiny bit of that, I was asked to, if that's okay. Sure. Um, because again, the beginning of this book is like a memoir. And then, then it segues big time into this huge story of her life. But uh, this is, uh, again, I, I enjoy doing this because, again, Jane and I are contemporaries, and uh, it was almost like reliving my life in a certain way. Although, of course, I'm not very fond of it, but we didn't know many of the same people. And, uh, and it, was, it, was, it was a fascinating thing to explore not only her movies, but her politics, which were very radical. I mean, she's, a, she's an activist. She, she risked her career to speak out against the Vietnam War. And I did a whole two year period at Columbia researching how the media impacted on her and how she impacted on media during the Vietnam War. But this is just a little bit of a trouble. Only Jane Fonda could upstage Oprah Winfrey. It happened on February 10th, 2001, during a performance of Eve Emsler's Vagina Monologues, which were being acted out by 60 mega stars in front of a sold out crowd at Madison Square Garden. The show was a fundraiser for V-Day, the international organization that works to prevent violence towards women. I'll never forget it. All the celebrities, including Oprah, stood in a semicircle, reciting their vignettes about some women's sexual triumphs and tragedies from index cards. All the celebrities except Jane, who had memorized her piece and when it was her turn, stepped out of the circle and gave a spellbinding rendition about what it's like to watch one's grandchild emerge bloody and screaming in his mother's womb. By turns anxious, tender, emotional, Jane ended the monologue with, and I was there in the room, I remember. The audience gave a loud cheer. At that point, Jane curtsied to a dark-haired young woman who was seated in the front row. It turned out the young woman was Jane's daughter, Vanessa Vadim. Months before, Jane had assisted the midwife at the birth of Vanessa's son, Malcolm. Jane was paying her homage. Afterward, there was a noisy party at the cavernous Hammerstein Ballroom, and Jane was surrounded by so many admirers, I had to push my way through the crowd to congratulate her. I did it, I did it, she explained to me, eyes sparkling. She hadn't acted in 13 years, and she suffered from such god-awful stage fright. I was petrified I wouldn't be able to get through it, she confided. But I did. We gripped hands. Jane and I have known each other since the 60s. We were kids studying with Lee Strasberg at the actor studio. I was an actress for 10 years on Broadway before switching to journalism while Jane was refashioning herself as Barbarella. I wrote my first article about Jane in 1970 for McCall's Magazine. She'd just been nominated for an Academy Award for her searing performance as a suicidal ma marathon dancer in The Issue Horses. She went on to win Oscars for Clued and Coming Home, movies that defined her political evolution. For the next three decades, I continued to write stories about her when she was burned in Evergy as Henry Jane, a couple of years later, the gal, Paul Lissiter, was one of the most admired women along in the world, along with Mother Teresa. Jane polarizes and the public remain fascinated by her. She has this extraordinary ability to reinvent herself in response to the times. Consider that she's transformed herself from movie star to political activist, to exercise guru, to tycoon life, and now in the 21st century she's turned into an exemplary philanthropist. She doesn't generate, she reacts to people and places and events. Everything, everything is fast-paced about the chaotic reality of America turns her on. And then I realized that above all, she's a consummate actress who has an uncanny ability to inhabit various characters at will. She once told me that the weird thing about acting is that you get paid for discovering you have multiple personalities. <laughs> Jane can will herself into becoming whatever she wants to be, which is why I wanted to write the book about her. So anyway, uh, 
I, I guess questions now? Or? Sure. Um, so, do you guys have questions? <laughs> compares to how writing your, your memoir compared to writing the story of somebody else's life and um, I'm not going to assume one was easier I, I do kind of assume one was easier than the other uh, the memoir is easier in that you do not have to research anything if you don't want to I mean I happen to want to research the time the times that I that my father lived in but with a memoir you don't have to go to the library and and, and, and look up stuff I mean you can just Take it totally from your in that in that sense, yes, it is it's easier. I mean, the, the fact checking on this kind of a book is just it's monumental, and you have to check all the facts if you're doing if you're doing a piece of journalism or certainly a biography. So yes, it was much easier, but it was mu and also much more emotional, you know, because I was writing about my life, my my family. So this is cooler, you know. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> cooler in the sense that you're, I wasn't involved with emotional. Yeah. What do you think about people like uh, James Frey who do dishonest memoirs? What do I think about people? Who yeah, I mean, it's, some people know. say it doesn't matter that he wasn't telling the truth in his memoirs. Some people say it does matter. I was wondering what you thought. Well, I mean, he did pass it off as the truth. I don't think you can do that. I mean, I, I think that's the right thing to do. Although, apparently, it was a very interesting book. <laughs> so he probably should have said it was fiction. Uh, maybe. I don't know. I don't, I don't approve of that. I, mean, I certainly couldn't do that. Yes? Um, I just have two questions. Uh, ten years is such a long time to work on one thing. Mm -hmm. um, can, can you give us any tips on, you know, sort of hanging in there for the long haul? <laughs> um, you know, I, all the stuff I've worked on, it's just like, I'm so sick of this that I can't stand looking at it. <laughs> I just wondered if you No, 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 but it, that, it is a problem. And what, I, what I've always done, although it's not that easy to do, I've, I've always, if I get stuck on something, I, because I'm a journalist, I will, I will do an article. I would get away from it for a while and then go back to it. But you do have to just persevere and focus, mostly. It's very hard. It takes a lot of patience. The other part of it was the um, when you were talking about the tragedies in your family and so forth. Um, writing about those things, uh, the, the pain of doing it. Um, well, it, you know, it's cathartic in a way. You, 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 you begin to think maybe you're, you're going to understand it a little better with suicides. My brother also committed suicide, so I had to double. I'm a suicide survivor. Whatever that means, it means you're 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 a survivor, and your uh, suicide survivors are also workaholics. They are, and maybe that's one of the things you work you work it off. But you you also in, in essence when you're exploring it's almost over and over again somehow it's not that it, the pain goes away the pain is always there uh, you get used to it but you somehow can accept it more and maybe understand it a little bit more. Yes. Did you, um, did you struggle at all in thinking about your own memoir with divulging family secrets, or was there, what was the sort of larger purpose? I know, well, by that time, both my, my mother and my father were dead. Uh, yes, there were, there were things that I did reveal that I, I was ashamed to reveal uh, in the beginning. My father also named names after being lawyer for the Hollywood 10, uh, which was like a total reversal, but he did because the FBI was after him, he wanted to get his passport for a lot of reasons, but it was still very hard for me to reveal, because I, I had revered my father, he was my hero, I didn't want to demean him in any way, but again, it was just, that's why it takes 10 years, you know, to figure all this out and to work it all out, uh, but yeah, I, I didn't tell him everything, I mean, you never, you never do. Yes. But, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, and it, you, you did write this at a time when this was long ago. So, and I've just been wondering, is there anything that you felt like you had to somewhat do to create something that you didn't actually have a memory of, to, or is every single detail the way it was? Well, you know, memory is, is not always 
that. Right. And I'm not, I, you know, I think possibly there are things that I have written in terms of descriptive stuff, maybe. It wasn't quite the same. I've recreated dialogue, you know, 50, 60 years ago. Probably didn't happen just that way. But I think the essence of it is there. I think the truth of it is there in, in the description. Maybe it's not totally accurate, but nothing really is. It's hard. Every, everybody's memory is different. Yes, it is. Yeah, sure. um, and this could be something everybody knows, but the, the, the story of the Hollywood Ten is so fascinating. Mm -hmm. Could you tell a little bit about your dad's moment and maybe explain a little bit in case there's anyone in the room who doesn't know the Oh, God. Well, the Hollywood Ten, it happened during the Red Scare, during, during, during a period in the United States when uh, everybody was afraid that Russia was going to take over the country. The communists were going to destroy America and America, the American dream. And it was headed by J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, who was determined to destroy the Communist Party in this country. I mean, he was out to get every communist, and he was relentless about it, and he was horrible about it. And as far as my father was concerned, because my father had defended communists, because the writers that he defended and the directors were all communists, but they didn't, you know, it's, it's not against the law in this country to be a communist. But Hoover was implying that it was, which is a terrible thing. And a lot of people don't know our, you know, our Constitution, our rights. A lot of people, oh God, you know, I, I, maybe I shouldn't be a communist, or maybe I, 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 maybe I've got to tell on my friends who are communists. But it became a, a time of paranoia and fear, and it was horrific. And my father was maligned um, and criticized for, for taking on this, this, this group. Also, his phones were tapped constantly. We never were allowed to use our phones at home. We had to go out to a pay phone. And years later, there's a funny story about this. My father was working for Robert Kennedy, and Kennedy was investigating the corruption of the Teamsters in the hot. And uh, my father finally asked Kennedy, can I, can I see my files? I mean, I, you know, finally he'd gotten his passport back the whole bit. And uh, so Kennedy got in one file. And you know what was in the file? taped phone conversations with me and my boyfriends. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they had in him. <laughs> so anyway, I've answered <laughs> Yeah. Um, what was your experience when the book came out with um, family and friends and their reaction? Oh, uh, most of my family had died by that time. But my, my father, some of my father's relatives were in Sacramento and they, they liked it. They, uh, my friends, yes, it, it, it was, I got good responses. People were interested in They liked it. It's not critical. Thing. Yes? I know that you said that your mom and dad had already passed away at you know, the time that you wrote this, but how do you handle writing about people who are still alive and who are going to Well, your like Jane, for example. You know, that, that, that's a good question because Jane is very much alive and very much of a public figure, and I didn't want to write a puff piece or, you know, uh, I wanted to tell the truth as much as I could, as much as I felt I could about her. I mean, uh, that was difficult too because she had given me her cooperation and we are colleagues and friends. But this is the way I did it. I tried anyway. Because Jane has done a lot of stuff in her life that she's not proud of and that is not very nice, okay? So what I, would, what I have done in the book is I will tell a story that is not that true, <coughs> but I balance it with another, or I, I, I just, I, I, try to, I try to be fair, but I balance back and forth between, she's a human being too. So I try to be fair, but that's the only way I can tell you I do it. Uh, it's, it's difficult, it's very difficult. By the same token, I do respect off the record. There was a lot of stuff that I found out about Jane that I would never use. I just wouldn't. Maybe somebody else would, but I chose not to. It's my choice. Yes? Um, well, yeah, being a good journalist, um, when you're writing a, a, a profile or, or a um, large book, <coughs> you don't just interview that person, you interview a lot of other people, perhaps. Can you just explain maybe that process and um, some of the young writers about talking to other people and what what kind of people you talk to for like something like the James Bond For a piece of journalism or or it doesn't matter. Or it doesn't matter, yeah. Well first you first you interview your subject, the subject you're writing about. 
but then you try to get as many different opinions and memories and stories from other people. They can be members of a person's family, they can be people in, where they work, uh, friends, maybe even enemies. You know, it, it depends on how, how rich and varied you want a piece to be. Uh, I mean, you can skew a piece anyway. You can make a piece very negative just by putting <laughs> nothing but negative stuff and, and, and dirty stuff. Or you can make it more balanced. But the more people you interview, the more you get a picture of the person, a portrait of the person. And when I write a, a piece, I very often wrote a piece about Paul Newman once. I spent like eight months because Paul Newman was so huge. And also, I wanted very much to, to write about his book, Philanthropy. Uh, and so I, I talked to everybody, it was very interesting, I talked to everybody in that wonderful hole in the wall gang, the schools, you know, the places that he, that he created, which he was proudest of. I, I, uh, I was able to find out a lot about Poland that I hadn't known, wonderful things, private things. But again, it was um, almost eight months, 5,000 years. So when you talk to so many people, you just have an enormous body of notes and material. Yes, yes. How do you handle all that distilling <laughs> into a book? Well, that's called craft. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. When I first started writing articles, I didn't know how to write them at all. It's taken me, I think it's taken me at least 10 years uh, to learn how to, to write a, a piece of journalism. Um, learning how to write what the lead should be in the middle and, and the middle and how to resolve it and what the point of view is. I was very lucky. I worked at the Times, not on staff, but I was a freelancer in the days when they hired a lot of freelancers. And I had a wonderful editor, Cy Peck, who actually taught me how to research and how to write an article. By He would just painstakingly, you know, show me. And I remember one day when I was looking at my copy, I suddenly understood what he was talking about. It was just about how to move material around. Again, it's, it's mysterious. It's mysterious and magical. You eventually all of you are going to have that kind of click where you God, I know what I'm, now I know what I'm doing. But it does take it takes a long time. And I'm still I feel I'm still learning. I'm still I will rewrite and rewrite and rewrite over and over. And then I'll see something else. I, would, I haven't done that right yet. You know? it's a long time. You do a lot of reading. <laughs> yes, others. I do. I do do a lot of reading. And I, my writers are favorites. Well, for I, you know Jeanette Walls, The Glass yes. Castle. Yes. Isn't that the greatest book? Isn't yes. that wonderful? Yes. I know her. She's a fantastic woman. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Wires, Mary Carr. Mary Carr. Are, they're two of my favorite memoirs. And the reason they are, first of all, their stories are so incredible. And they're great writers. And Mary Carr is a poet, but she feels that's one of the reasons she's, you know, such a good writer. She, she knows how to use language and use words, and that too is very. <coughs> Although the most important thing is the story. It is. Does anybody know St. Clair Lewis? No. I mean, you know, people don't. But I mean, I'm naming a writer who won the Nobel Prize, and he really wasn't that good a writer, but he was a great storyteller. Washington, when he stood up in front of the House of American Affairs Committee, 
I mean, they're, they're actually in their newsreels. You can see my father in the newsreels of Bob Lightfoot in, in the uh, archives, I guess. Um, but it's just, it's piecing it together bit by bit. So how about, for example, your, your personal memories of your father? Why do you have so many? Like, how did you choose which one to? Well, I, I very often would relate them to the Hollywood. Very often I would relate them to an incident, say if it was the Hollywood tale. I remember I kept a scrapbook on him, okay? So I was able to look and see all these things that, that he'd done and the, the articles that were written about him and what he said about the, 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 the terrible times that we were going through in terms of lack of freedom of speech, et cetera. So that was the, the, the thing that, that I used for my own memories. And also I remembered him. I remembered what he was like when he came home and talked to us about it. And, and, and shared all the things that were going on with him. Yes? What would you say was the overarching purpose of your the memoir? Was it to understand yourself? Was it to tell the story? Was it to understand your family? Or what, what was, what, well, it was all those things. But yeah. the, my, per, my, my initial purpose was to tell the story of my father's career and his politics and what he had done because he's a, a footnote in history for many reasons. Uh, that was my initial the initial thing I wanted to do, but in the back of my mind, of course, I was remembering and, and obsessing over my family and what had happened to us because he had killed himself. You know, so it was, it was a duel. But I definitely wanted to tell that story because I couldn't stop thinking about it. That's the other thing I could not stop thinking about. Did you find that I've heard from memoir writers that they think they don't remember certain things about their past and then actually being in there being in that time and remembering it and writing it down actually brings back more memories. Did you have that Oh, yes. Yeah, so it happens to me all the time, yeah. Well, just in the case of this first, the first thing that I wrote, I mean, that I read about the fire in the nursery, the garden was very important in our lives. And as soon as I started thinking about the garden, I remembered the eucalyptus trees and the ivy beds and the people on the, on the hill standing there looking at the fire. And it's just one thing leads to another. It's very exciting. When you're writing these biographies that span huge amounts of time and involve so much research, how do you organize? Do you outline your material? Do you, you know, put your to timelines? How you're going to fit it? Yeah, no, I make a timeline. I do. I, I make made countless timelines for for this book. Well, for that book too, uh, because the. The lives of the people that I was writing about, like my father or Jay and Fonda, were so complicated. But they also they fitted into certain time frames, like the 1950s, the 1960s. And then I would list the, the events of that particular decade that were the most important in their lives. And of course, then I would have to feed in the stories of these events and the people and all that. It, it's, very, it's like a puzzle. I mean, when you're writing a book like this, it's like uh, solving a mystery because you're always looking for clues. Sometimes you do not have the answer right away. And then you find it, miraculously, if you keep looking. So we just have time for two more questions. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you had talked about, in the books that you've written about other people, about trying to present sort of a balanced picture so it's not either you know, some kind of an attack or versus right. like off piece. Um, but how much do you worry when you're writing about what the reaction of the subject is going to be and what have been some of the reactions of people you've written about? Uh, I'm, I'm always, I'm, I'm apprehensive because, well, for example, the biography I wrote of Deanne Arbus, the photographer, her family did not want me to do the book. I did not have cooperation from part of her family. I had cooperation from her brother, Howard Nemeroff, the poet, but I did not have cooperation from her daughters. That was, a, that was very unpleasant. It continues to be to this day. The family will not allow my book to be in museum, library, museum, bookstores, etc. They talk against the book. My life was threatened by her lover. He called me up and said he wanted to kill me. Uh, he didn't, and luckily, luckily, <laughs> <laughs> I should say luckily, he actually died just before the book came out. But then friends of his called and said, I had caused his death by, because I had written this book. So sometimes you have things like that happen, but um, it, it is not necessarily <coughs> what you want to have happen. It, it's the most, that's the most complicated and difficult thing that's happened vis-a-vis -vis a book that I wrote. 
but by the way, it's a good book, it's a valid book. It's not, no, it really is. But, but his, the family did not want me to write about her and, and about her complicated sexuality, and I did because I thought it was part of the story. So they do not like the book. And uh, I know that. So that's it. Can you just really talk about, um, even though you're writing memoir and biography, there's still a narrative art. There's still a narrative art similar to science fiction. But even though you're writing a memoir and biography, which are true stories, you still have to make it interesting. You have to make it have a middle beginning and end. Right. Just how do you how do you decide that? Like I know somebody talked about the things like your memories, but how do you decide what the overarching story is for that that person? It, it depends, you know, depends on, on the subject. Uh, I mean, you, you have to know how to write in an interesting way, you know, uh, and, and in an entertaining way to, to grip the reader. But how to decide, I don't know. I mean, uh, I think one of the ways is to choose interesting subjects, seriously. Uh, and I think if you do that, you're, you're, you're on your way. But how to decide, it's only by searching, trying different, you know, variations of your theme or of your of your birth, of your character that you can come to the conclusion. But you can't decide right off. I don't think. That's a very good answer. Very good. <coughs> well, um, for those of you who are really interested in reading Patty's full memoir, you can click on the link that Girls Right Now sent through last week. Uh, to read it. Um, anything you're a little hard to desire. So thank you very much, Patricia.